Well, it looks like most people are in now, and I'd like to start. So good day, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thank you uh, for joining us uh, for today's Folio Forum, uh, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment, EBSCO, and Index Data. My name is Sharon Wiles Young, Director of Library Access Services here at Lehigh University, and we are an Olay Library. I will be your host for today's forum, and our topic is uh, the single tenant implementation, as you can see on your screen. Today's forum, like all forums, are recorded and posted to the YouTube channel under the Open Library Foundation. As an open forum, all participants are, can see a participant's names, see the questions submitted, and we have muted everyone for the best sound quality. We value your participation today and encourage you to uh, engage in the topic by using the Q&A box in Zoom and um, enter any comments in there, and our speakers will take your questions after each of their presentations. If you tweet, please use the hashtag Folio Forum, and we encourage you to continue conversation and discussion on our Folio discussion site, which is discussion.folio.org. So our speakers today are Kate Morma, uh, Director of Product Management at EBSCO Information Services, and Susan Kimball. Head of Access Services at Amherst College, a member of the five colleges. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to Kate to get us started today. All right, thanks, Sharon. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. All right, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I um, am going to talk to you today about um, the single tenant implementation option in Folio. So let's get started. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so this presentation began with a single, sing, simple question. Can or should my organization implement Folio as a single tenant? This question is relevant for consortia like the five colleges who we'll hear from later but it's also relevant for individual institutions as well, um, particularly those that have semi-autonomous campuses or even libraries. Um, it's a, a simple question, it seems, but actually there's quite a lot of information that's needed to be able to answer it properly. So um, I've worked with the product owners for all the various apps in Folio to pull together the information we thought was most relevant to this decision. Um, I know this was helpful for the five colleges and hopefully it'll be helpful for you as well. All right, so just, um, uh, you know, what do I plan to cover? There's actually a lot of information in this deck. Um, much of it is in the appendix, and we'll share the link um, after the presentation so you can drill in and, and see what's in there. Um, but we're going to start off um, looking at just some background and basic definitions. Then we'll talk about access control, um, in particular permissions and the concept of ownership. Um, then we'll move on to other data segmenting features that are relevant to this question, um, service points, loan rules, fee fine tables, and wrap up with some other relevant factors. All right, so some definitions to start. Um, a multi-tenancy is a type of software architecture. It's how Folio is architected. And it basically means that a single instance of a software application is running on a server and serving multiple tenants. So what's an instance? It's a deployment on a server. So for example, EBSCO hosted production would be an instance. Um, Folio snapshot stable is an instance. And then finally, tenant uh, is a separate logical context within an instance where each tenant appears to have their own installation. So they've got their own data, their own configuration and so on. So for Folio, the tenant is like an organization um, and other multi-tenant applications, um, the tenant can be, could be the user, for example, um, Spotify, um, it, you know, the, the tenant is the user who has their own playlists and settings and so on. Um, but for Folio, a tenant is the organization. 
Um, and just a note down here at the bottom that organizations that host Folio themselves may have just one tenant on their instance. And that's part of why um, this distinction can sometimes be a little confusing, but um, hopefully it's, it's clearer now. <clears throat> All right, so the current situation. Um, so currently Folio does not offer any cross tenant functionality. Tenants are completely isolated from one another. Um, that said, Folio does plan to offer what we're calling cross-tenant consortia functionality, um, which will support controlled sharing of data uh, across tenants. And for many consortia, I really think this will be the model that best fits their needs. So given the current situation in the future plans, I have sometimes been asked to provide a comparison of the single tenant versus the cross tenant consortia implementation options. Um, and that's just, um, it's just not possible right now because the requirements for the cross tenant consortia functionality are still being worked out. It's just not um, possible to kind of compare and contrast. So what we're gonna focus on for this presentation is just what we have in Folio today. So sort of the current situation. Um, and when I say what we have in Folio today, I mean that a bit loosely. So I'm also including some things that are, um, may not be in Folio you know, as we speak, but um, for which the requirements are very well understood. Um, you know, stories are in the backlog and, and we plan to do the work in the near term. Um, okay, so the, the current situation, um, you have really two options if you wanted to go live on Folio um, today. Um, you would be able to um, implement as a single tenant, in which uh, case you would need, you would, you would basically be sharing everything. So in this model, we'd place the entire organization in a single tenant. Everything would be shared. Um, there are a few exceptions to this, we'll cover later. Um, and you, you might need workarounds. Um, if, you know, if there's places where you want data to be restricted or partitioned, you, you kind of need to use some workarounds. So self-discipline, gentlemen's agreements, those sorts of things, because really in general, data is shared. Um, if you were to implement as multiple tenants right now, since there isn't, you know, we don't have the cross-tenant consortia functionality yet, um, really multiple tenants now means share nothing. Um, so we'd place different parts of the organization and separate tenants, nothing would be shared. And, you know, if you wanted to share data, you could probably use some workarounds, um, data duplication, but it's, it's not ideal. Um, okay. So you may be asking, why would a single tenant implement, implementation equate to sharing everything? I mean, can't, can't we limit sharing through user permissions and other data partitioning? And the answer to that is, yeah, of course we could, but we don't really want to do this. Um, and that's because the tenant is really the natural level of data segmentation in a multi-tenant architecture. So the more time we spend introducing data segmentation and access controls within a single tenant, the less time we have for building out other things like the cross tenant consortia functionality we know we need. Um, so it's kind of a general principle um, that we're, we're using. Um, that said, there are some areas of Folio where data segmentation is needed, even within the single tenant um, scenario. And so we're gonna do what, what's required to um, support what's needed there. We just need to be very cautious in general and not go beyond what's truly necessary. All right, so let's talk about access control. Um, so theoretically, access can be controlled using permissions and ownership. Um, there are some different types of permissions, some of which are supported in Folio today and others um, which are not. Um, Function-based permissions, so for example, create user or view request, um, sort of CRUD-based, create, read, update, delete. Um, CRUD-based permissions are supported in Folio today. Um, this is what you'll see if you look at the, the user permissions and permission sets that we have in Folio today. These are function-based. Um, there's also a concept that we're calling action-based, uh, for example, cancel fee fine or change due date. This is a little more granular than the function-based because it allows you to control access to a, a, a single action. Um, and this, um, we do have, uh, we do plan to support this feature. It's not yet available in Folio, but it is um, absolutely planned. Data element-based, um, for example, the ability to 
create a permission around just a single data element on a record. So say, for example, the ability to view user address so that you could give some um, folio operators the ability to view the user record without seeing sensitive data like the user address unless they had the special per permission for it. This is not supported in Folio. It is a possible future feature. Um, we do have um, some things in the backlog um, and we've talked about some ways that we could address this. Um, so it's, um, it's not uh, you know, immediately planned, but it is something that we're thinking about. We don't have a whole lot of use cases for this yet. So it just hasn't sort of bubbled to the top of the backlog. Um, and then finally, data value-based permissions. For example, the ability to create a permission around the value um, of a data element. So let's say edit, the ability to edit users where patron group equals staff. We don't support this in Folio and we don't currently have any plans to do so. Um, and then uh, this other type of access control um, ownership is, it sounds a bit like permissions, but, but it is different. It's just a separate concept. Um, we do have plans for um, support of a team-based um, access control um, where, for example, you, you'd be able to set up some teams within your tenant, um, you'd be able to assign users to teams, and then you would be able to give a team ownership over an individual record. So, for example, a workflow. Um, and you could say, you know, we only want to allow users on team one to edit this workflow. We'll talk a little bit more about teams later on. All right, so I have um, some screenshots here of the users app, just as an example of how permissions work in Folio and, and what we don't support. Um, most of the apps in Folio really behave very similarly to users. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Um, there are also screenshots in the appendix of this deck um, showing many of the other apps and um, the specifics there. Um, but really, it basically works this way. We've got these function-based permissions, um, such as can view user records. And if you don't have at least the ability that permission can view user records, then this icon um, to access a user's app won't even show up in the top nav for you. Um, similarly, you won't see the new button for creating a new user unless you have um, the can create user records permission. Um, likewise, for the edit um, icon here, you can only see that if you have can edit user permission, user's permission. <clears throat> okay, so now we're looking at um, the edit view of a user record and um, just wanted to point out again that this is pretty much an all or nothing type of thing. We don't have the ability to create permissions around certain data elements on the user record. So. You know, if you have the um, can edit users permission, you can edit all the data elements in the user record. It can be a bit confusing though, and some of you who are very familiar with Folio may be saying, but that's not exactly right, because I see when I look at the user record um, that there are things on the user record like user permissions or user proxies and sponsors, and there are specific permissions around those. And that's true. Um, and the reason why we are able to do that with, with these things like proxy and sponsor and loans and user permissions is because they're actually not properties of the user record themselves. They are related records. So it is possible for us to put permissions around the management of proxy and sponsors or you know, the assignment and, and unassignment of permissions to users. Okay, so now moving on to the data value-based um, access control. So it is not possible to tie permissions um, to data values. So you can't create a permission that says, can view users where patron group equals faculty. It's, it's just not possible. That said, you can filter. So you know if you have the ability to view users, you can come in and if you only care about one patron group or another, you can filter down. Um, similarly, if you have the ability to edit users, you can choose any patron group. There's no way to exclude options from the menu based on your permissions. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, um, most other apps really behave like users. So take a look at the appendix to, uh, to see the specifics there. Okay, so let's talk about teams now. 
So the team's concept originated in the designs for the workflow app, but it really is a kind of a general platform feature that can be applicable in many different places. Um, so what you see here is a mock-up of the workflows app, and you can see in this access and error handling section um, that there's some teams associated with this workflow. And it says, you know, certain teams, Team X and Team Y, are allowed to edit this workflow, and Team Z is going to be notified if the workflow fails. Um, so these are some of the ways that we'll be able to use Teams. Um, the idea is, is simply that you'll be able to create Teams in settings, you'll be able to assign users to Teams, and then assign Teams to records, um, and that will control access um, at the record level. So actually our first implementation of Teams is not going to be in workflows because that's a little ways off, but in acquisitions. So um, the acquisitions um, folks needed some additional data segmentation and access control. And um, they had originally planned something specific um, for acquisitions called, they were calling acquisitions units. But after speaking with Philip and um, understanding the, the Teams concept, um, they decided that Teams was going to work just as well. And um, that's good because that allows us to get started on this Teams feature that I think we'll want to incorporate into many different apps. Um, so uh, yeah, so it will be a first implementation. It will be a simple implementation. So we probably won't go as far as what you saw in those original mockups um, for workflows, uh, at least to start out. Um, but you'll be able to create Teams and settings and then associate um, Teams with funds and orders so you can control access to them. So there are some mock-ups in here. Um, this is showing how you might create your teams in settings and you can see here some example teams that would be applicable in the context of acquisitions. And then here's some mock-ups showing how you can assign teams to a user record. Uh, they are possibly really small on your screen um, but um, you know you have the ability to assign multiple teams to one user. So users can be in many teams. And then um, now looking at a um, screenshot of um, or a mock-up of uh, a fund record, you can see that there's a menu down here um, where you can select the team um, that you want to kind of own this particular fund. And um, there will be something similar in orders. Um, I believe they have planned that there will be sort of a default option of you know where the teams it would, by default, a record would be owned by all teams. So you don't have to use teams to control access, but if you want to, you'll be able to. All right, so that's the plan for teams. Um, and we talked about um, permissions. And now I'd like to move on to just some other data segmenting features, um, just some, some features that um, I think are relevant when you're considering what kind of flexibility you'll be able to have um, when implementing in a single tenant. So the first of those features is service points. <clears throat> so service points are functional locations um, like circ desks and they can be associated with locations. Often um, one service point will cover many shelving locations. Um, and each service point can have their own opening hours. So um, opening hours are not you know, a blanket thing in Folio. You're able to set up different opening hours um, for each of your service points. And then service points are associated with users in Folio, similar to the, actually to the way um, we plan to associate teams with users. So we're gonna be able to leverage much of the um, the UI anyway, the components that we're creating for that. And then um, when users log in, the service point is then associated with a session. And so associating a service point with a session allows Folio to reference the appropriate opening hours so that it can calculate due dates and so on. Okay, so now um, a little more about loans, but um, transitioning into loan rules. Um, loan rules are the mechanism in Folio that allows you to target policies to your transactions. Um, and it uses loan rules, you use location um, and other properties as well. But I think when you're you know, a, 
um, distributed organization considering implementing as a single tenant in Folio. It's probably the location that you're most interested in here. Um, basically, loan rules allow you to say for a given patron group, which is of course on the user record um, or the borrower record, um, and then from the item record, you know, material type, loan type, and location, which loan policy should apply. Because we do have location as one of the properties and loan rules, we are able to report different policies, loan policies for different locations. We're also planning on leveraging loan rules to allow, um, to, to target fee fine policies to transactions as well. Um, we'll probably actually change the name of loan rules It'll, because it's, it's, it's a little more generic now. We're thinking about incorporating fee fine policies and request policies and patron notice policies. So that is, they'll, it will kind of morph into a more general CERC rules. Um, but it will still make use of the same properties, patron group, material type, loan type, and location. Um, so different locations can have different fee fine policies. And uh, different locations will be able to have different requests and patron notice policies as well because of the loan rules. Okay, now moving on to fees and fines. Um, this is another area where we have some segmentation within a single tenant. So um, fee fine settings are um, organized by a concept uh, called fee fine owner. So each tenant can create as many fee fine owners as they need. And then fee fine types um, that are collected by that fee fine owner can be defined and the amounts for the different fee fine types can be defined. Um, so it's not, you know, that it's, it, there's not just one set of fee fines. You can have as many different fee fine owners as you need. So when you are manually creating a fee or fine in Folio, um, the fee fine owner is selected. Um, it, there'll be some sensible defaults, so um, you don't have to manually search for, for the right thing every time. Uh, but then, of course, the, the fee fine types and the fee fine amounts will populate accordingly. And then for automated charges, um, these will also be based on fee fine owner. And the way it'll work is basically um, each item has an effective location, and then each location has a primary service point, and then each service point is associated with a fee fine owner. So um, Folio will be able to traverse these relationships to access uh, the fee fine owner for a given transaction and calculate the automated fee fines accordingly. Okay, now to the last section, other relevant factors. Uh, controlled vocabularies um, do apply to the entire tenant. So if you're in settings in Folio, you can um, define some controlled vocabularies or custom menu value options. So um, for example, in the item record, there are menus for material type and loan type and um, the tenant decides what values should be um, in those menus. Likewise, on the user record, um, the patron groups are tenant defined, the address types are tenant defined. Um, these controlled vocabularies are not segmented. There's just one set um, for all the records in the system. So um, just something to be aware of. Um, right now, we also only have one locale and time zone per tenant. Um, this means it's only possible to have um, you know, one language, uh, one number format, one date display format, and so on per tenant. So that's another thing to consider. And um, before I pause for questions, I just wanted to kind of show some of the things that are in the appendix for later, um, if you're interested. So, um, you know, here are some of our thoughts on um, how we might support data element based permissions. And then you can see screenshots of all the different apps and how uh, permissions are working in these apps, Codex, Inventory, eHoldings, and so on. So there's a lot of good stuff in the appendix there. But that's really all I wanted to cover today. Um, so I will pause now and um, ask if there are any questions.
looking in the Q and A box, and I don't see any. But I do have a question, Kate. Um, so, if you have a single tenant and you're set up as a single tenant, and you're um, for a campus that might have a law school, a medical school, that's how you would set up, right? As a single kind of tenant for each one of those uh, parts of your campus, right? I don't think so. I mean, I think it will depend, but I, I would assume, uh, I, I guess it would really depend on whether or not you have shared circulation. I mean, a single tenant is really, that's kind of the primary, the tenant is the primary organizing um, factor. Okay. factor. And so, yeah, do you have shared circulation across the schools? Do you have a shared user uh, management across those schools? Then if you do, um, then a single tenant would, um, might be a good fit. If you don't, if you really do have sort of separate um, data and, and rules and things like that, you, you might want to consider the multi-tenant as an alternative or the cross-tenant, sorry. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, yeah. Um, we do have a question. Uh, what does CRUD stand for again? Um, it's create, read, update, and delete. So kind of the main functions on a record. Um, it's pretty rough. It applies to the entire record. So if you have the ability to update, it's, you know, it's, it's all the entire record. That's, that is um, right now what we have supported for our function-based permissions are really almost all um, CRUD-based. Anything else before we go to Susan's presentation? Okay, here it. If you have separate tenants, can you share the catalogs in Discovery? Um, I believe uh, you can, because often, dis uh, hmm, I don't know if I can answer this question, but I think you can. So I think often Discovery works off of files that are, are sort of exported, in a sense, from your um, ILS. And so it may be possible to merge together multiple um, catalogs for the purposes of discovery. Are there any plans for statistics and reports? Um, yes, there definitely are. Um, and there will be, uh, so right now we're working on logging um, data and folio and making it accessible for external reporting. Um, so you will be able to um, create um, a data lake um, that has all of the data um, exported from Folio, including um, audit trail um, of changes. And you'll be able to um, access that data and manipulate it using external reporting tools. So that's sort of the first phase um, for reporting. Um, but we also have plans for um, lots of in Folio or in app reports. Um, that um, we will, you'll be able to access from right within Folio. Um, we have some, I don't know if you would call them in-app reports in Folio, but many of our apps are sort of, um, uh, we call them search and sort apps. They're, um, you, you, when, you, when you view the app, you're looking essentially at a list, a filterable list of records, so users or requests. Um, and in a sense, those lists are reports as well. So, um, and, and we can do some exporting on those um, already. So we, we have the ability to say export uh, requests to a CSV. So you can do some additional filtering and sorting um, outside of Folio. But right now, um, all reporting um, is sort of centered around the tenant. So certainly when we get to the cross-tenant consortia, functionality, I'm sure that reporting across tenants is going to be a huge part of that. Um, but like I said, we're, um, you know, we're still in sort of the, the design and, and requirements phase for consortia, the cross tenant consortia functionality. And we have a follow up question. Um, is there a harvester to share catalogs and discovery instead of using FTP up and down? Um, so we are right now, for example, working on OAI PMH um, that is being developed. Um, I don't know beyond that um, what harvesters we have. I'd have to um, I'd look at, I'd have to look into that. Any 
other questions before we go to Susan? Thank you for those questions. And Susan, do you, are you ready to uh, take over? Thank you, Kate. Well, I would like to thank um, Kate for that introduction into single tenant implementations and thank you also to Sharon for the introduction and to Ole, EBSCO and Index Data for inviting the five colleges to participate in today's um, event. Uh, my name is Susan Kimball. I'm the head of access services here at Amherst College. We're one of the five colleges and I serve as one of seven members of our folio implementation team. Um, I want to talk today, my part of the forum, my slides are not advancing, just a sec, is to um, talk about how we at five colleges came to decide on a single tenant implementation of Folio. So first a little bit about the five college consortium. We are five institutions located in Western Massachusetts. Uh, one large public university, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and four small liberal arts colleges, Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith. Collectively, we have over 35,000 students, faculty, and staff. We have a very long history of uh, library cooperation in the Valley, the Pioneer Valley where we live. Um, our consortial relationship dates back to the 1950s and the libraries represent one of the strongest and oldest areas of collaboration in the consortium. The five college libraries automated together um, in the mid 1980s and we've migrated three separate times, always as one unit. You can see a snapshot of our collection statistics and our circulation statistics here. Um, Nearly a quarter of all of our lending is consortial, demonstrating our reliance on each other to support our users' research needs. A little bit about our discovery environment. The four colleges have used, um, in addition to our Aleph OPAC, we implemented the EBSCO Discovery Service in 2011. At the time, UMass Amherst had been using WorldCat Local as part of another consortial arrangement. Um, and they switched over to WorldCat, I mean, to EDS with the rest of us in 2017. Since 2017, we've had five separate EDS instances that have similarities, but we get a single feed from Aleph and a variety of other local data sources, depending on our institutions. We also maintain five separate um, SFX instances for our link resolving and A to Z journal lists. So in 2015, our five college discovery committee, which is a committee made up of members from all our institutions, submitted the next generation ILS return on investment report, which determined the following, um, a pretty um, <laughs> damning statement about our state of affairs. Our current ILS and it's all its attendant and supporting systems are fundamentally ill-equipped for the digitally oriented and hyper-networked modern library and library user. Um, so this was, they prepared this report um, and looked at what our current systems were. And in that preparation, they created an inventory of our discovery infrastructure across all five. This map, which was updated in 2018 as we were looking at Folio, gives you a sense of the complexity of our current discovery environment across the five colleges. I don't expect you can read all of it, but it basically breaks down all the different systems that we use either at one institution, five institutions, or anywhere in between for metadata, collection repositories, discovery, circulation acquisitions, um, so you can see that we're dealing with quite a bit of complexity as we look to a new system to solve some of our troubles here. The committee weighed lots of factors as it looked at, an IL, at the ILS landscape at the time and determined several key needs for a new library platform. Um, 
And the cost benefit analysis came up with the following. Um, essentially, the overlying theme here is that we needed to increase alignment across formats, workflows, and policies. Um, we needed a system that format wise could approach print and e resources as a single in a single workflow as opposed to duplicating all the workflows in all the systems that we currently have. We needed to simplify and align workflows across institutions, consolidate knowledge bases, um, again, reducing the duplication of data entry and reducing complexity with regard to discovery. We needed something in the cloud that has been um, clear for a long time and increase opportunities for collaboration and efficiency across all five. The irony of these determinations was that our migration to Aleph in 2006 was from a system that had already required a tremendous amount of agreement across institutions. Um, and the response to what I consider kind of negotiation fatigue was to move to a system and configuration that allowed for nearly infinite individual customization um, and and the ability to kind of do everything on our own and separately and not have to agree on anything. I really see this as the market overcorrecting. Um, the grass is always greener on the opposite of what is troubling you most at the time when you're looking. And uh, the unintended consequence of this extreme transition was that the customization requires much more staff time and expertise at each campus which has become a tall order giving so many competing priorities um, now. It's become increasingly difficult to share knowledge um, as our practices have diverged, not in their goals, but in the, in the details. In the, when we get into the weeds, we, are, we can't compare um, and help each other as much as we have in the past. Not only are we struggling with multiple redundant workflows from different formats within our own institutions, we now all perform that work slightly differently. I see Folio as the pendulum swinging back towards the center, providing us the opportunity to realize some of the goals listed on the slide. We are seeking to strike the balance between individual control and workload efficiencies. So, the Discovery Committee report summarized the recommendations with this statement. Um, for the five colleges, a next generation cloud-based ILS affords us the opportunity to achieve operational efficiencies by taking advantage of modern technology and also by choosing in this moment to become a single library in the automation sense. And we'll, it will have the Im significant impact by consolidating multiple systems and streamlining workflow creating a more unified presentation of our data and by enabling more seamless access to collections across the valley, our Pioneer Valley, lovely Pioneer Valley that we live in. So the bottom line is about improving user experiences, user experience and creating seamless access to collections across the entire five colleges. Our current Aleph configuration um, is much more like the multi-tenant installation that Kate presented that is anticipated in the future of Folio. We share some things, um, patron and bib databases for one, but individually control most things in our own silos, um, cataloging, acquisition, circulation. Over the time, practices have diverged and knowledge about how we originally configured the system and why has eroded. Our five college ILS coordinator is called upon to do work with five separate institutions um, and sometimes in five separate ways, slightly separate ways. Um, I really see us needing to move back to a situation where that person can do the work once on behalf of all five of us. So where does that take us in? Oh, I'll give you one example of that um, before I move on from my area. So loan tables, um, anyone who's ever looked at a loan table knows that they're very complex um, animals. And it seems strange to me that we maintain five separate loan tables when 90% of our loan policies are shared and aligned. Um, yet we have to maintain lines and lines of data to, to support 
our individual configurations within Olive currently. So Folio's single tenant implementation, um, one real endorsement for it was that it was available now and that's what and we're ready to, we're really excited about Folio and wanted to do something now. So we looked at that as our as one thing that could be done now. If we chose cross tenant, we would have to wait. And that is also was also an option on the table at the time. Um, in the single tenant implementation, we will share bibliographic records, users, inventory, all of the things share, quote unquote, everything. Um, we will use teams for resource management functions like acquisitions, e-holdings, um, separating funds, vendors, owners, as that functionality becomes available. And we will use service points for circulation functions, which we do currently as well um, for things like loan um, policies, fines and fees, and things like that. The single tenant implementation allows significant align alignment with policies and workflows. It also leverages a single user database, which we have now, and allows us to set up only one set of loan rules. Um, and it also preserves the ability to partition workflows where it's appropriate with acquisition, service points, etc. Our overarching goals, as written by our five college librarians councils, the directors of all of our libraries, um, a commitment to standardized shared workflows is what prepares the five college libraries for adoption and ad adaptation of most current technologies. And the advantages of consortial work outweigh the additional communication and compromise required for agreement. So at a principal level, this is where we are coming from. Um, the advantages we're looking for are improved user experience and elimination of redundant workflows and a better ability to support each other across our consortium. A wise person shared this vision with me recently. Do it once. If you can't do it once, do it the same. And if you can't do it the same, at least do it together. Uh, another way to state this is that we need to change our default mode of operating from working separately and sharing where we can to aligning first and branching out only when we need to. We know this is gonna be a very hard transition as all system implementations are, um, but these are our goals to prepare us for the future and it will be a process of letting go of our sacred things and keeping our eyes on the shared vision that we have for our institutions. Thank you for the opportunity to share our approach at five colleges. I'm happy to take questions, comments, feedback now. Let's see, we have one question. How will you manage funds across cam campuses? Um, so similar to, well, so we haven't seen the funds in action yet um, and gotten into the detail of that part of Folio yet. Um, as I understand it from Kate's slides, we will associate funds with the teams that are, are at each campus. Um, and our campuses are relatively single shops so that um, there's one acquisitions unit at each institution and those I imagine would be teams and those teams may be further partitioned. It sounds like that's an opportunity because it's at the individual user level um, so that those needs will be determined as we move into looking at the acquisitions and e-holdings modules. Any other questions for Susan? or Kate at this point. Thanks for the answers there. Those are great answers. So, um, I don't see any more questions, um, but thank you. Um, and let's see, I'll check again. There is, oh, there is another one. Uh, could Kate say a bit more about what is planned for the multi-tenant consortial model? So um, uh, I can point you to a backlog in JIRA. So we have a SIG that focuses on consortia 
uh, questions and um, they have been working for, for quite some time now and have um, done a lot of work to um, identify the key requirements that need to be met of a cross-tenant consortia um, functionality. Um, so let me send along with the um, link to my presentation. I will also send a link to the backlog in JIRA for that. So you can scan through and see, you know, what are some of the things that have already been identified by the SIG. Um, and if you're interested in contributing, <laughs> um, the SIGs are open as well. So um, you can reach out and, and join the consortia SIG. So Kate, will you send the link out? Is that what Should I put it in chat right now or how would that be great? That would be Okay, let me um, any other questions while we wait for Kate to put the link in? Uh, there's a question about um, first time attending one of these forums and are they done regularly and how do I know when they're happening? Good question. Um, we do have a group of the uh, uh, forum facilitators who um, go through uh, some interesting uh, topics that come up and we try to do them every two weeks or so um, and we send out the um, information through the Folio website, uh, through listservs, and um, we do it um, on our Folio um, documentation. So uh, you should be able to um, get that information from, especially from our Folio website now too, um, but we're trying to get the word out as much as possible. Okay, and Kate has put in the link for everybody. Um, and also in the chat box, uh, Rachel from EBSCO has put in the calendar, um, the Trello calendar that she keeps up to date to on all the events um, going on in Folio um, as well as the forums. So that's another way you can access that. So any other questions? I just added also oh. a link to the, um, to the consortia EPIC in JIRA. So uh, the way JIRA is structured is we have EPICs, which are kind of like big sub projects, and then those are broken down into features. Um, so uh, if you look at that EPIC, you'll see a list of linked features associated with it. Uh, that'll give you a sense of the kinds of things that have been identified for um, consortia to functionality. Oh, that's great to look at JIRA and see our user stories. That's wonderful, guys. Let's see, so I think we've answered most all, the, oops, wait. Um, where's the link? Does everybody see the links? They're in the chat box. Um, bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a chat or top of your screen. That's where we put all the links. Anybody find them? Also, you should have the ability to add comments to my presentation. So if you have any questions or comments as you're going through, um, feel free to just add them and I'll try to answer them when I, uh, when I see them come in. Uh, and also the links will be available on Twitter also if you want to check there. Um, and then we've got another question. Uh, when will the five colleges consortium go, go live? Sure, so we are, um, we are one of the three institutions that's doing the beta partnership with EBSCO. And we are going to be the last to go because we are the most complex in terms of we are a cons we're the only consortium. Um, and so the intent is to go six months after the, the individual institutions go live um, to work out the, the kind of the things that Kate was talking about with the partitioning for single um, tenant. The single institutions don't necessarily have to do that 
work. So um, we are going to be delayed a little bit. I think as er the earliest we are looking at is um, kind of December, January, 1920. But again, where it's it, it will depend on the development of folio um, and when it has gotten to the point where we are comfortable switching over and uh, and EBSCO is comfortable. We've had another request, Susan, um, if you could put the link in for your presentation as well. Sure thing. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can. Okay. Thank you. So, any other questions? Thank you so much, Susan. So the link is now in the chat for that as well as I'm sure Rachel will put it up on Twitter. So that's wonderful. Oops, you can't see it. Oh, it, I see what happened. It went to the panelists. I'll just... Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. I'll send it again. Oh, good. Yeah. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. So does everybody have that? Did everyone see it? Let's make sure. All right. Well, oh, yep, they saw it. So thank you. Well, this concludes our um, Folio Forum today. I think I've answered all the questions. Let me make sure. Yep, everyone can see everything. So that was good. And uh, please continue this conversation at Folio um, site at discuss.folio.org or on Twitter, um, hashtag Folio Forum. And you can find your links there as well. And the recording will be posted shortly to the o uh, Open Library Foundation YouTube channel. And our next Folio Forum, since somebody asked about our next Folio Forum, will be held on October 31st. And the topic is going to be on the EBSCO innovation grants that were put out there. And uh, several libraries will be talking about their development of um, their apps and development under the, these grants, which is exciting. So the announcement for that should be going out shortly. So you should be able to see that. And I really thank everyone for their questions today and for um, getting involved and engaged with this topic. And I also would like to thank Kate and Susan for their wonderful um, presentations and for framing this, this topic for us. So that was wonderful. So um, we will see you on the 31st for the next Folio Forum. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sharon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Bye.